The increasing cost of housing is a problem that affects millions of homeowners across the United States. Sher has found one solution to the issue of rising housing costs. Their mission is to make home ownership a reality for renters with unique loans and co-ownership programs. The founder and CEO of Sher, Eric Chabel, has been in the real estate business for over 15 years. Eric has always had a passion for home ownership. He went on to become one of the youngest real estate brokers by the age of 23. His appearance on the Bright Founders Talk podcast was pleasant and educational. Enjoy this episode with Eric. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Tami. Tami is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Today, our guest is Eric Chabel, who is founder and CEO of Share. Hello, Eric. How is your day? Uh, I'm very excited to share some of my thoughts and uh, to be on, on this podcast. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Happy to see you today. I can't wait to talk with you about share, but I want to ask you firstly, what is your favorite part of being an entrepreneur? You know, there's a lot of different things you get experienced to. Uh, I would say the diversification uh, in roles. So uh, as an entrepreneur, you have to wear a lot of different hats, especially when you start a company. So whether that be in sales and marketing, you're really your your own person uh, right from the get go. So uh, I I you know I, I definitely it's a great opportunity. Um, but I would say my favorite things are building a team is for sure uh, finding people who are like minded uh, and as well as uh, just being creative. How have you grown personally from becoming an entrepreneur? It would be from uh, my leadership skills. As you initially start, uh, you know, a company. At least from from my perspective, my growth from working together as a team and really working with you know like-minded individuals. I, I would say that you first start, when you first start off. Well, at least speaking from personal experience, right? It was definitely a big challenge, but as you continue to fail and learn from your failures i think that's you need to be able to be coachable and and be able to fail quickly and learn from your mistake so uh failure is definitely inevitable in in the startups or really in life i mean when you start something it's like riding a bike are you expected to do the tour de france as soon as you get on your first time on a bike no um so that's that's the type of mindset so um you know, I've been fortunate enough to definitely improve some of my public speaking. Uh, a story that, or you know, a true story that I have is when I first started Share, I had a terrible fear of public speaking, and mm-hmm. uh, and it was only because I was exposed to these huge uh, presentations, uh, and I had a friend of mine who had told me, "Look, Eric, you need to get over your fear of public speaking." Uh, or your company, it will be a challenge for it to thrive, and and you need to improve your communication skills. And so, with that being said, uh, definitely, uh, I went from being terrified to speak in front of my friends mm-hmm. to now speaking in front of four or five thousand people. So it just, uh, you know, it's a learning curve, and you need to be able to get over your fears quickly. Let's come back to 2019. The share was founded. Uh, what was the driving force that made you start your own business? It was my my background. So my, I went to school uni- uh, originally at University of Washington in Seattle, studied engineering, architecture, finance. I got my real estate broker's license, my loan officer's license very early on in my career. And through my experiences, I was working at the largest general contractor a company called Swinnerton Builders uh, when I was 23. And although I was getting promoted every single year, uh, my rent was going up around 10%, which a lot of people in the United States are experiencing. And they've been continuing to experience uh, annually. With that in mind, I, I knew that affording a home on my own was impossible to do, even if I was getting promoted every year. 
And so I started to look into alternatives, uh, not only for myself, but also to help my friends and my family. Uh, and so uh, with my experience in the real estate and engineering space, I used that as a force for good to, to help not only, of course, myself, but to help my friends, my family members, uh, and just the general community. Uh, because we know uh, some standard things is that in order to afford a home in, in metropolitan areas in the United States, you have to now earn individually $200,000 in uh, USD. So, I mean, that's a huge amount of income for a personal uh, income. And then if you want to move outside of those metropolitan areas, the average income now needs to be $100,000 for an individual. And even that is is really tough uh, to, to earn. And so, uh, I mean, in the U.S. right now, we're, that's about three times what the average annual income is in the U.S. And so uh, looking at those those numbers, uh, I thought that there has to be a way to to multiply your buying power. Uh, and I looked in this model around, well, if I'm already sharing a space and, and living with someone, or if my family, if I have family support, uh, why can't I simply just buy that home together with this with, the, with these people? And I looked into this model of co-ownership, and it turns out there's been a massive demand co-ownership, a 771% increase in this in this market. So uh, th that was really some of the driving forces of, uh, uh, you know, once I, I knew the pain points, then I started really reviewing the market. Is there a market for this and does it exist? Uh, because one of the tough challenges is creating your own market. Uh, is there a product market fit and is there even a market demand? You know, why today? Uh, and so given that it's just the home prices are just absorbently too expensive, mm -hmm. uh, that something very innovative needs to be developed. And, and that's really what led to the creation of, of SHARE. Share makes uh, home ownership simple and affordable through co-ownership programs and unique loan options. Uh, also, Share is a real estate marketplace. Quite a lot of work, I consider. So could you please give us more profound details about what Share is exactly doing? Yeah, uh, so it, it, it is definitely a lot of work. Um, for those of you who are building you know, a, a, a two-sided marketplace, it's uh, a challenge to say the least. But what Share is doing is it allows individual uh, renters to be able to buy homes together and co-own either on one loan or they have the opportunity to have two loans on one home. Mm -hmm. And so how the consumer experience is, is uh, traditionally now a consumer will come to us and they'll be earning maybe around $70,000 uh, income and they will get qualified with our internal uh, loan system and our, our and our uh, brokers for about say around 240 $250,000. Now, the, the problem with that is that the average home price right is, is much higher than that. And so uh, once they realize, okay, I'm qualified for this amount, I can't afford a home. Um, what's the next step? And so Share will explain as a concierge service what are the co-ownership opportunities for this individual based off their financial profile. So credit score we take into consideration, of course, uh, income, debt. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of different underwriting conditions we do weigh. Uh, and then we, of course, find them the property. Uh, we provide them the loan. If they want to meet on share and say they don't know who they want to buy with yet, because uh, you know, something in life is that as you grow, uh, you know, people go in different directions. Uh, people get married and, and, and move in different areas of the world or the country. And so uh, share can also provide you with a new co-owner. So someone else you can meet with. And so, although that sounds so strange, like buying a home with a stranger, mm -hmm. uh, unique, benefit here is that you don't have to live with this person and so we will provide you with a two unit so you will have your own space 
You don't necessarily even have to meet or see this other person and you have your own loan. So uh, the concerns about what if the other person is to miss a payment, mm -hmm. that's that's not a concern of yours anymore. And so um, that is some of the unique value propositions. And then of course, share is meant as a stepping stone into home ownership. So meaning that your the intention here is for you to build equity. So you you own the home, you keep it for a period of two to five years, then you sell on your own terms. And so mm -hmm. when you sell it, you have the opportunity to sell on your own or use one of our uh, very highly experienced team members to help sell and get the maximum value for your individual ownership. And so that's how we're trying to build wealth for individuals. And so uh, uh, it's 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 a full service. And although this is, it's definitely a newer <clears throat> uh, paradigm shift, but as I mentioned, co-ownership has been existing for years, but no one has centralized it and made it simple for primary residential uh, co-owner. You have experience as a real estate broker, so you understand the industry inside out. What changes have you noticed during the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, and what are your predictions for the future? Home prices have continued to increase, uh, especially in, I mean, generally speaking, when you when we look at even in the course of the past you know year, yes, mm -hmm. home prices have slightly been adjusted, uh, but when we're looking at it from a whole, uh, our predictions is that based off of the past sixty years of data, home prices will continue to increase, and even if you know you say when people think of okay, our is is the crisis, what happened in the U.S. Uh, with the subprime mortgage uh, during the 08 crisis, um, is that still going to happen again? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of now regulations in place to prevent. And even if that did happen again, worst case scenario, which experts, uh, what I found, the vast majority agree that th that won't happen again to this type of an extreme. But the point being is that uh, home prices, even if you kept your property during the crash, you would still be in a much better position now than if you were to have sold or not bought. So uh, the, the point being is my prediction is home prices will continue to rise. Uh, we're seeing population, overall world population is continuing to increase. Mm -hmm. So there's only so much space right, in the world for, for housing. We also have the remote, uh, the work from home policies are changing. So many companies, uh, big tech companies as well, are actually requiring at least uh, more of a demand for coming back to work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there was a nice, a nice opportunity for home buyers to get some relief who can get outside of the metropolitan areas, but that's being changed now because you are being required to come back to the office at least, you know, once or twice a week. So uh, our predictions is, Home prices will continue to increase. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate agents, in fact, it's it's such a saturated market of real estate brokers and agents. Uh, so a, a number that many people don't realize is that 87% of all real estate agents and brokers will never make a single sale in, their, in five years and completely quit the industry. So knowing that almost nine out of 10 people who are in this field will financially be unsuccessful, uh, I I expect that unless they adapt to this new co-ownership model and learn how to diversify their skill sets and now convert their clients of renters to now co-owners, um, I think they're going to be struggling. So uh, I, I think the success rate of realtors are going, it's, I think it's going to improve as they adopt to co-ownership. Mm -hmm. And I see that there's going to be a more, equitable opportunity for more home buyers mm -hmm. uh sharing homes and just from a from a sustainability standpoint as well sharing homes versus owning on your own you know the construction development cost or, or construction development rate is is quite has been slow slow growth so uh with that being said this at least gives an opportunity by sharing these homes for the construction to slowly pick up the pace and to continue ongoing developments 
let's come back to share. Uh, what was the most challenging part for you and your team? Finding product market fit is one of the most challenging things. This is a new paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And although there's a lot of indirect competitors that are talking about this co-ownership space for vacation homes and secondary homes, which is a great opportunity that we're leveraging, it still remains a, a big challenge. And so uh, for the normal consumer uh, to afford a home. And so, and to understand what is co-ownership because uh, and so I guess to, to wrap it up, it would be education, education and, and getting that over to our consumers has been a, a big challenge. Uh, when you think about buying a home, you think of, most people think of, okay, how did my parents do it? Mm -hmm. And when, when back in their time, you know, you look back 30 to 40 years ago, if you were, you know, a, a waitress or a server, or if you were earning like, you know, 30, 40 K a year, you could afford a home. But now looking at it today, that's completely impossible um, on your own. So explaining and giving that educational information to our consumers has, has been the biggest challenge and letting them know that this is a new opportunity. And of course, since home ownership, it's such an expensive and, and personal feeling that when, when and the pride of home ownership that goes along with it, you know, it's not like you're just buying a, a simple product like you know clothes or something like this, where you can re, re, refund it or you know. But there's a lot of emotions that are attached to it, and trying to get to the consumer to understand that this home ownership is a financial vehicle to build wealth. Mm -hmm. So this co-ownership is meant for an intermediary step to then get build a family and so on and and. But, you know, historically speaking, owning home has been the greatest resource to build wealth. And relaying that information to the average day consumer who is not acclimated to home ownership and those terminology, that has been uh, our, our, I would say our biggest challenge is the knowledge. We're built with using a variety of different tech stacks, uh, React, uh, Java, um, Ruby on Rails. Uh, we do integrate with a few APIs as well. So uh, such as we're integrated with several different uh, property data feeds. So that gives our consumer a ton of different resources in terms of what types of homes they want, what types of loans they can be provided. Uh, and so, it's we built our code from scratch uh mm -hmm. and so it's always ever changing and we what we tried to do and what we're always aiming to do is of course not only using open source code but using code that doesn't um that we can not only own but not rely on on other apis and other integrations because that of course leads leads uh, it's open to you know, if the, if the company goes under, you know, who we're using, then our consumer will ultimately uh, be let down a bit. So uh, we're always trying to build in-house uh, and always trying to find that balance between, okay, does it make financial sense versus mm -hmm. just doing an integration? Do you see uh, the preference of uh, some technologies in your industry? No, not, not so much. I mean, with real estate, there's not a whole lot of, huge tech changes uh, mm -hmm. because the reason I, the reason I say that is because um, going back to the emotional feeling of buying a home, you we need to understand that tech will never be able to just solve and a person buy a home only relying on tech. Yeah. There has to be, like the, the bigger the purchase, the more human element is involved. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, with, that, with that being said, uh, we're, we're seeing a variety, either Ruby on Rails or, um, or uh, you know, React, or it, it really just changes. But uh, we're not seeing a, a whole lot. I mean, a lot of tech companies that we're seeing use even like WordPress uh, or just use a lot of free, uh, free tools that they can just 
uh, host their website on. So uh, nothing nothing too sophisticated uh, that's really changing it out there because it's a lot of that human element. Mm -hmm. You've already mentioned some changes that changes that will happen soon uh, to the industry. So uh, they will influence your company. It's obvious. So considering this, uh, where do you see share in five years? Being nationally across the United States, uh, we would like we're aiming to be the go-to co-ownership platform for first-time home buyers, uh, mm -hmm. so they can more easily co-own and fractionally sell. So we are, we want to be across. Uh, at least the majority of the states where home prices uh it requires at least uh majority require two uh two people to buy the home uh but definitely uh we're aiming to be closing and, and helping uh a annually uh around uh eight to ten thousand home buyers annually is our goal mm -hmm. uh at the end of the five-year mark and so uh we are we are continuing to grow our team, and so yes, we're that, that's the type of persona we want to help is, and end a five year mark, and we also want to have some new, uh, exclusive loans for co ownership, being able to finance them on our own, and being more, uh, independent from using APIs and using other, uh, affiliated resources, and being able to just really provide a turnkey operation for our consumer. <laughs> Was it hard to find your teammates? Yes, it is. You think this is the right company. You know, I believe this is going to be what you want to do. But then as you go to market, that's when you really learn, okay, maybe this is not the right fit or different changes. As an example, in 2021, we were, one of our revenue sources was a lead gen provider. So what we did was we helped this massive market of consumers, home buyers, Come mm -hmm. on together, connect them to this massive market of not so successful real estate agents and brokers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in theory, it may make sense because we're now making a, a new market for people who can't find find the market. So it turns out that that was not as as successful as we wanted. We made sales, but the point was was that. Uh, we learned that this real estate, the real estate agents and brokers need a lot of education around what co-ownership even is. So uh, with that being said, the team completely evolved. I mean, we don't, we only have one or two people from that initial initiative. So um, as you grow your team, just be, you know, what I found is being cognizant that, you know, although someone may be really good at, selling one product or selling a service that service in a few months you may find out that it makes no sense financial mm -hmm. sense um the product the, the the industry doesn't like your product so you need to terminate that product and then revisit and change something else and so if your team can adapt to those changes you you need to let them go and so uh you know we've gone through multiple cycles of of, of team members um as we continue to improve our product but Right now, uh, I would say that our, our team intelligence is one of our strong suits, uh, and it is definitely it is hard to find uh, people. But you know, we've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to have applicants come in, in coming in from LinkedIn um, mm -hmm. and AngelList. Uh, so, but yeah, just being aware that I would say just being aware that, that the team is going to change. It's inevitable as more products come out and as as different lines of business get terminated. To sum up our conversation, I want you to uh, answer the, I can say, most captivating question. What advice would you give to someone just starting their own business? Start it now and, and don't be afraid of failure. And because you know, people ask me, well, aren't you nervous or aren't you scared? And you know, I've always they say, oh, I've always thought about doing this. Whatever you're doing right now, that you know, that is a is a constant fixed variable. So mm -hmm. if you listen just to like Einstein, Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So 
So if you're continuing in your position and you're not happy, you remaining there, it's not going to change your happiness, uh, most likely. So uh, do what do what you love to do, and you'll never work a day in your life, as, as you know, a quote that's always referenced. So <laughs> find what you love to do, and if you want change in your personal development and your career growth, make a change now, and, and don't be afraid of failure because it is impossible not to fail. Just remember riding a bike. You're not going to go to the Tour de France as soon as you jump on a bike. You have to fall. That's just how that's in life. So make sure you learn from those failures. And the faster you can fail, the faster you'll get to success. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I want to thank you for the, for sharing your story with us uh, and also that you find time to join us today. Of course, Alexander. It was a pleasure meeting you. And I hope uh, I hope the entrepreneurs and other listeners who are following this podcast and video will uh, will find this informational. And uh, if they want to, if anyone wants to reach out to learn more to me, uh, they can visit me uh, at uh, share at share dot app. That's c h e r mm-hmm. at c h e r dot a p p, or visit our website www dot dot com to learn more.